Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moni wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show in the iHeartRadio app on Apple Podcasts, Audible, Amazon Music, Spotify, wherever you find your podcasts. Our guest today is Dr. Kim Dwyer. She is here to celebrate her wonderful book. It's called Rocky's Christmas Journey based on a true story. Hey, Dr. Kim, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me tonight. Really happy to have you on here tonight. This is uh, really caught my eye. Uh, Rocky's Christmas Journey is a true story. It sure is. Tell me all so about Rocky's it. Rocky's Christmas Journey was inspired by a new story that came out um, right before the holidays last year about a saw wet owl that was found in the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. So that was a tree that was cut down in upstate New York and brought to Manhattan for the iconic Rockefeller Center uh, plaza and, and near the skating rink and all that. Um, and what they originally thought was a baby owl was found in the tree. It was actually a saw wet owl is a very small species of owl, um, weighs about four ounces. <laughs> so it's a really small owl, but this was a full-grown adult owl that they found in the tree. So I saw that story and it just immediately like sparked an idea that this would be a great story uh, with the opportunity to talk about so many different emotional situations and transitions and reactions that everyday children go through. This little owl went through that as well when he had this unexpected journey from upstate New York to Manhattan and then eventually to a uh, wildlife center on Long, I Long Island where he was released. Wow, that's fascinating. So many, I mean, first off, I had no idea that there were full-grown owls that were four ounces. I, <laughs> I've been in the wild, and one of the most terrifying and wonderful experiences that I ever had was camping up in Maine. It was real camp, you know, right out in the lake and there was nobody around us and there was a moonlit sky and it was really cool and we didn't hear anything until this giant beast was right over our heads and it <laughs> turned out to be this am amazing beautiful owl but it was like death from a button I mean if I was a little rabbit or something I'd be a goner because I had no idea this thing was coming. Yeah, uh, here in our neighborhood, um, I'm just outside of Denver, but we're right on the brink of the foothills. So there's a lot of wildlife that was here before people were. Uh, we have a, I think it's a great horned owl that lives in the neighborhood that you know, makes appearances. And, you know, every once in a while you might see him or definitely hear him. But one night he was on the very apex of our roof. And, of course, we all went out into the backyard. We got the dogs inside, went to the backyard to watch this owl and he was just sitting there and he's pretty high up. So he didn't look all that big. Suddenly he starts bobbing his head mm -hmm. and swoops. And <laughs> I probably <laughs> screamed out loud because they're huge, you know, and we just don't, we don't typically see such large animals in the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that great horn owl has a cousin. That's just a, a, a tiny a, little owl. About as big as my computer mouse. Yeah, not very big at all. Yeah, could probably, you know, easily fit in our hands. It doesn't weigh very much. So saw wet owls, um, I did a little research when I got the idea of like, okay, this sounds like a children's book. Saw wet owls were named that because their call apparently sounds like a saw on a wedding stone. And that's kind of the mechanism of the story that I created is why did this owl not fly out of the tree when it suddenly heard commotion and people and saws and all that? Well, this little owl in my story heard that that saw on the wedding stone and thought, oh, it's just another owl, nothing to be worried about, and went back to sleep because it was daytime when owls are supposed to sleep. So that's kind of what I used in, in researching these little owls and, you know, the little inspiration that came to me of that's why this owl is going to hang out in the tree and, and not worry too much about it until suddenly – you know, surprise, he wakes up and he's not in his forest anymore. He's got buildings instead of tree trees around him. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your specialty, please. Sure. So I'm a clinical psychologist. 
Um, I have worked for the past couple of decades with children, teens, and families. Um, I've worked in school settings and outpatient settings. Um, and I've, I've worked a lot with children. I've worked a lot with uh, learning disabilities and evaluating kids for dyslexia, attention deficit disorder, other types of uh, difficulties that can impact learning. Um, and in doing that and in, in working with kids over this time and working with the grown-ups who support the kids, the teachers, the parents, uh, the families, I've often pulled from using books as an opportunity to work with kids on difficult emotions or any emotions for that matter. Um, there's some great books that uh, I've used with kids um, just to introduce them to the concept of therapy and get them talking about emotions. Um, and you know, that can easily help a child be more comfortable sharing what their experience is when they see like, you know, what's the experience of the character in the book. So I've worked clinically um, a lot with kids and adults with anxiety, um, worked around transitions. Um, I do a lot of work using mindfulness skills, so helping people bring their attention back to the present moment and use um, emotions and thoughts as uh, almost like a window into understanding our value system and, and aligning our behavior in the direction that we want to go in. So for me, moving into writing um, children's books was really kind of a natural, like a natural transition from the work that I've already done with kids. Yeah. So much there that I, I want to get into, you know, first you talked about, you know, using books as a kind of a window or door into therapy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've had uh, one of our favorite guests, Dr. Ron Melman, uh, has been on, talked a lot about bibliotherapy and the fact mm-hmm. that, you know, we can use books, um, you know, you know, our, our kids are having some some issues. Maybe they're not risen to the point where we have to have professional intervention, maybe, uh, or maybe along with professional intervention, we can use books and we can start having these conversations. One thing that you you talked about was, and, and I hope I'm getting this right, is helping kids align their values and their emotions along with their behavior. And am I right in thinking it's uh, you know, the kid is kind of acting out and having issues, helping the kids sit down and uh, understand, okay, what's important to you? Where do you want to go? And how can you deal with this emotion in a way that's going to help you get to where you want to go? And did I figure that Absolutely. out right? Yeah, yeah. And that's a big concept, mm-hmm. you know, for a small person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so It's a know, big concept step. for big people. It is. It is a big concept. Um I have a lot of adults that I work with and when we're working on this that'll be like, why didn't anybody teach us this in school? And, and the good news is schools are incorporating a lot more wellness and emotional wellness into curricula, which is wonderful to see. Um, but back, back to this question, when we're working with young kids, we might just be giving them the words. So what is this big feeling that I'm having? Where is it in my body? How do I identify it? Can I just even give a, a name to it? Um, so working with kids to develop feelings vocabulary is really powerful so then they can articulate how they're feeling. And it might even start with, you know, I can identify by pointing to a happy face, a, you know, kind of a straight line face and a frowny face. Which one of those, you know, am I in? Then I can start adding some metrics to it. Am I at a zero, a one, a two, or a three? For an older kid, we can go up to 10 and start to identify where are, like, the I think of it as the point of no return, right? Mm-hmm. So if I'm on, you know, the scale, if I'm on the angry part, if I've identified I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling mad, and I'm at an eight, maybe that's the point of no return for me. And I need to do something to get control of my body before I can problem solve and work through something logically. So maybe I take a run around the block. Maybe I go sit quietly and pet my dog for a little while. Maybe I listen to some quiet music in my room and then when I come down to a six or a four or a three, then I can go talk to my parent, my teacher, my friend, whoever it is about what I'm feeling and why I'm feeling that way. And one thing I like to remember is that emotions aren't really right or wrong. You know, right and wrong is a label and we might label behaviors right and wrong, helpful or unhelpful might be a more accurate way of labeling them. But the emotion that may precede that behavior is just some information from the body, you know, some combination of our physiology and our thought process coming together to, to provide this response. Um, and like getting into the values piece, uh, if we have a situation maybe where we feel 
uh, maybe a child feels they've been disrespected by a friend, a friend um, cut in front of them in line. Like that's a big one that upsets small people. Often it upsets big people too, but if somebody cuts in front of you in line, your sense of justice has really gotten triggered because you have this idea about what's fair and how people should be. And this person violated that. And if we get so angry that we're at an eight and we're like slugging the kid in front of us in line, you know, then we end up probably at the principal's office and with some behavioral consequence. If we can rein the emotion down, like we can listen to the emotion, but, but bring it to a point where it's not so instantly bubbling into a reaction and into behavior. Um, we can maybe get to the point of being able to say to, your, to the person who cut the line, Hey, Joe, like that's not okay. I was here first. You know, the rules back mm-hmm. of the line, you know, and that's a nice assertive skill that we can teach a kid. But if they get to the point where like they're slugging kids or, you know, reacting, in a, a really large behavioral way, then we end up identifying like this is a problem child, a problem behavior, and even the emotions are problems when they're just information. Yeah. I, you know, I can uh, share, I know by experience and, and I have a, an incredibly uh, wonderful, talented son who is an, an adult right now, but had a very difficult um, time throughout his, his youth, especially in, in middle school. And when my beautiful wife and I took the time to stop feeling disrespected from his behavior and started talking to him and doing exactly what you've been talking about, sitting down with him. Okay. What's the emotion you're feeling? Okay. What's a better choice than to throw something? What's a better choice than to start yelling? Oh, you want to get some space? Fine. What is it that you want in your life? You have some goals. Is this kind of behavior going to get in the way of you achieving those goals? Yeah, okay, so what kind of options, what different things can we do? And it made a huge difference in in his life. So uh, if if you're the parent of a young kid and you, you're not sure this is going to work and you were brought up to just, Hey, I said to do it. I'm the dad. That's why you should do it. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily work this. And it, if it works, it's not working for the reason you think, <laughs> you know, uh, and this is a better choice. Well, and, and you're also hitting on a skill that needs to be in place for the parent. Mm -hmm. is to have some of that emotion regulation going on for themselves so that they can model it for a child and so that they can show up in the moment. And in order to kind of be there in the moment and recognize an individual behavior as something that can be discussed, we have to like peel off the layers of, oh, this kid does this every week. I'm so sick of it. Why can't they just get it together? Why do I have to keep having this conversation, right? And we're human and our brain is really good at forming these concepts and we form them very quickly. Psychology, we call them schemas. And then we go and we apply them. And sometimes they're a great fit for a situation and sometimes they're like an iffy kind of fit. But if we start seeing every example of a type of behavior as you know, being really contained by this preconceived notion that we have, then we just launch into reaction to that notion as opposed to, okay, what actually happened with Joe today? Like, tell me, let me really hear your situation and maybe we can be more present and be more validating, which sometimes like that's a key piece of what kids might need is Mm -hmm. for somebody to hear them and say, yeah, you're right. It's not fair when that happens. I'm really sorry. You had that experience. Yeah. 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 That's all it takes. So, so, so important. So, in Rocky's Christmas journey, we meet this this teeny weeny little owl who ends up in Manhattan, probably dislocated from the beautiful upstate New York area. Uh, so what kind of emotions is Rocky feeling, and what kind of emotions sure. can we talk to our kids about? Absolutely. So Rocky starts uh, his journey before he gets to his own tree. He starts with his parents, and he leaves the nest. So he he begins as baby owl. And he's no longer a baby and he becomes brave owl and sets off into the world and has to find his tree, um, then moves from his tree against, against his wishes, perhaps, um, into Manhattan, um, where he's suddenly at this tiny owl in this big world. So, you know, the way I've, I talk about him in the book and his name changes, he doesn't get the name of Rocky, which they tr- did truly name him Rocky or Rockefeller once he was found by the, the person who found him. Um, but he doesn't get that until the very end of the book. So he goes through this transition from baby to brave to tiny, you know, kind of questioning the braveness to Rockefeller, which is like, whoa, that's too big of a name to mm-hmm. Rocky, which seems to fit him really well. 
So the emotions that, that go with that, that I think kids experience and adults experience too, is, you know, when we are transitioning from, you know, from the house to the school or from, you know, I have my oldest as a sophomore in college. So from home, you know, off to college, you know, we're leaving the proverbial nest. Um, but we do that like in, in tiny steps daily before we get to the point of really being out there on our own. And even as adults, we do that. We go to new jobs, we form new relationships, we move, we pick up our whole family in our nest and we move off to a different place. Um, so there's, you know, there's feelings of excitement. Mm -hmm. There's also feelings of nervousness and, um, I don't spell out like what Rocky is feeling, but part of using the book in a more bibliotherapeutic way is to talk with a child about like, how do you think Rocky feels? Or at this point, baby owl, how do you think baby owl feels when he leaves the nest? What might he be thinking about? What tells you that he feels that way, you know, in, in how he looks or in how other things are happening in the story? How do you feel when you're in a situation like that? How do you know that you're feeling that way? What does it feel like in your body? What kinds of things might you think about? Um, when we do that, like we're modeling, we're providing vocabulary and helping children with vocabulary. We're also helping kids to nail down those other identifiers of emotions. What, what do people's faces look like? What does their body language look like? What do they do when they have feelings like that? Um, and we're also helping them take perspective because with that example I just used, baby owl leaving the nest, some kids might be like, that's super exciting. And other kids might be like, that is absolutely terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I'm staying in that nest and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to kindergarten. <laughs> Forget that. So we can also help kids with the perspective taking of you might feel this way. How might some other kids or owls feel in that situation? Because maybe it's going to be different. Yeah. And that can really help build that empathy and compassion for others. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we hear a lot of times uh, parents complaining, oh, my kid wants me to read that book again. <laughs> but, you know, there's so many different ways that you can read a book. And you just hit on one. How, you know, in one setting, how do you feel about this? If you were baby, Al, how would you feel? Mm -hmm. In another setting, sit down and say, well, I remember you told me you would feel this way. If you were baby, what about some of the kids in your class? What about your best friend? How do you think your best friend might feel? And mm -hmm. helping helping the kid understand it, making the experience different for you and for your kid, but also helping the, your kid get that, pers you know, that idea that people have different feelings, have different perspectives. Exactly, exactly. One of the things that I include in the book um, at the end, there's kind of like the story behind the story, which is the the true story from, you know, what we can glean from the news reports um, of Rocky and where he came from and a little bit more about that kind of owl. Um, but I also have a caregiver's guide for reading together. So qu there are questions um, that to use as a starting point and certainly, you know, a parent could read it and come up with lots more questions based off the ones that I have in there, but questions to help talk about uh, the feelings, the emotion identification, perspective taking, um, empathy for others, even like some critical thinking, like what would you do if you found a wild animal by itself? You know, what might you do to help that? Um, who are other people that can support, you know, when you're in a situation like that? I also have some questions in there that are geared more towards literacy. Like, what do you think happens? Like we can certainly use books to help kids uh, learn to read essentially, <laughs> right? So when we're reading aloud, we're providing a model for the, the phonology, the sounds that link to the symbols. So kids, once they start getting in, to the point where they're reading as you're reading, they're, they're decoding and you're providing a model for, uh, for those sounds. We're also helping them to refer to pictures as a decoding support, which is a really important skill for emerging readers. Um, we're teaching them that there's a sequence to a book. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's some uh, lessons they can start learning about um, making predictions and stories. So, like, often before flipping the page, what do you think is going to happen next? Like, that's a great question to ask kids to get them thinking. Um, and you also picked up on sometimes kids like to hear that same story again and again. And there's something in that repetition that is masterful for kids of, you know, maybe they're, they're dealing with, 
some emotion or, or some situation and, you know, hearing that multiple times, like helps them to gain that mastery. And sometimes it's just the routine of it. Like mm. we read to my oldest, we read good night moon every single night to the point where we wouldn't even open the book. We would just, my husband and I would sit down on the side of his bed and the three of us would recite good night moon. And it was this great little, you know, family moment for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What we, you, you provided this great guide uh, and tool for parents, but there may be a parent listening to us right now saying, I, I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I have no background. <laughs> Jedley used to be a social worker. You, you, Someone taught you all this stuff. That's how you were able. But I don't know any of this stuff. I, I you know, how can I talk to my kids about emotion? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think you just start and you just ask the question, how are you feeling? where I love to ask, where is the feeling in your body? If you could draw that feeling, what would it look like? Is it squiggly? Is it round? Is it square? Does it move around? Does it change shapes? You know, and don't overload a child with too many options, but maybe give a couple of examples. What color is it? Grab a piece of paper and draw. When I feel angry, it looks like this. You know, maybe my angry is red pen and, you know, sharp, spiky things. You know, maybe, maybe your child says, well, my angry feels like this and it's more of like a ball that sits in their, in their belly. Any conversation about it is a great starting point. And, you know, parents can also do their own, um, work and reflection on how they experience emotions and what they do with it. You know, not everyone has a great model for Mm -hmm. how to handle emotions. Mm -hmm. And, um, I do think parents do the best they can with the tools that they have in front of them. But if you don't have that in your own toolbox, and you, we can always seek it out and we can learn no matter, you know, no matter what age we are, we can learn how to approach emotions in a different way. There you go. That's exactly right. I love that. You start by starting and you're going to make mistakes, Sure. you know, you, but the fact that you're there and you're talking to your kid, I, I think a lot of times we forget about the fact that as parents, we are the most important person in our kids' lives. We're the most important teacher, and, and somebody has said to me one time, well, but what if we're a bad teacher? Well, you're a bad teacher, and that's not good, but that's still going to be a very important lesson in that kid's life. So don't be afraid to grow yourself. And I know that you have a, a book for parents that can help them grow a little bit in their practice of mindfulness. Can you tell us real quickly about that? Sure. It's called Mindful Mondays, Transforming the Everyday to Claim Calm and Reduce Stress. And in writing the book, my aim was to make mindfulness and mindfulness meditation more accessible and approachable for everyday living. So zend out for 30 minutes. Maybe we've got time for that, and that's wonderful if we do. But I think the real power of mindfulness is when we can bring it to bear on just everyday moments and application. So I use the analogy in the book of raindrops. So raindrops are small, but they're very, very plentiful. And we can have lots of raindrop moments through the day. When we come back to right now, we get ourselves out of the future, like especially anxious brains live a lot in the future. Um, And a lot of times we also live in the past. So if we come back to right now, usually we're okay. Um, and in doing that, we, we reset our central nervous system. So coming back to right now, noticing where I am in space, noticing my breath, noticing how my body feels, hopefully it sends a signal up to my brain. Hey, she's okay. She's sitting in her chair, having this conversation, nothing to be worked up about. And any, if we're already in like a heightened state, our fight or flight has started to kick in, that can very quickly start to reverse it, settle the body down. Um, and give us a little bit more space for centering and for noticing, are we having thoughts? If we're having thoughts, do we want to follow them and connect with them? Some thoughts are really useful and might be worth following, and other thoughts might be habit of mind that we get into in certain situations. So going back to that situation earlier, if we're in a parenting moment and we're pulled into, oh, this kid does this every night, I can't stand it, why does this keep happening? Those are all just thoughts. And their judgments, <laughs> like their, their judgments, and they may very well going to be super helpful to come in to, you know, to a, a new parenting moment in time, uh, already responding based on the last ones. Um, so that's like a great opportunity to notice, oh, I'm having all these thoughts and these are thoughts of judgment and thoughts of I can't stand this. And 
not sure if that's going to be real helpful to me right now, but I can take a deep breath and return to right now. I have a child who doesn't want to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can walk in and be curious about what's going on and why this child doesn't want to go to bed and what might we do together. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that being in the moment and stepping away from this is the fifth time this week. I'm tired of this. I'm the father. Why don't you listen to me? All that stuff isn't helpful, but what Mm -hmm. is helpful is, you know, taking that deep breath and being present in the moment, and communicating with your kids. Mm -hmm. And then we're also modeling, because our kids know that we're upset. Absolutely. Probably want to make us upset. (laughs) Often, you know, there might be some button pushing, which is kind of diverting from whatever the other, you know, the real issue is, is like, let's get mom and dad revved up, and now we'll be discussing bedtime instead of this other thing that's Mm -hmm. more important. Um, So, you know, when we can say and even catch ourselves, like maybe we start down that road of, you know, how dare you do this? I told you what to do. Maybe we catch ourselves and say, you know what, Joey, like I just caught myself not really doing what I wanted to do. I I said some things that, you know, that was my, my anger coming out and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to take some deep breaths. And then I want to finish this conversation. Hey, do you want to sit next to me and take some deep breaths? We can try it together. Mm -hmm. Maybe they will. Maybe they'll say, mom, you're crazy, whatever. They're still watching what you're doing, no matter what words are coming out of their mouth about whether this is helpful or not. Um, and you know, that can be powerful too, to like, A, admit I made a mistake, B, here's how I'm going to correct it and C, here's what I'm going to do to get my, my body back in, in control. Yeah. 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 I, being able to let your kid know that you made a mistake, that you don't know everything. I, that's the advice I give every young parent. It's like you, your kids are going to put you on a pedestal thinking that you are perfect, that you know everything. The quicker you can get off that pedestal, the better. It's a long fall off that pedestal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the longer you're up there, the higher it gets, and then the fall comes really bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Kim, I know people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about Rocky's Christmas Journey, which would it would be a great book to read at the holidays. But I think it's a great book to read all year long and Absolutely. also where they can go to find out more about you. Sure. So the best way to find out more about me is my website, which is drkimdwyer.com. Uh, there's a uh, opening page there. And if you click on books, that'll take you to uh, book information. Um, Rocky's Christmas journey is available in soft cover and ebook off of Amazon and hardcover from Barnes and Noble. And then uh, mindful Mondays is also um, available from Amazon. Awesome. We've had a really eye-opening and fun conversation uh, about a great children's book and also about how we can help our kids become more mindful, become more aware of their emotions and help them change the way they're reacting and dealing with those emotions so that they can have a, have a better life and be happier. And we've been having that conversation with the author of Rocky's Christmas Journey, Dr. Kim Dwyer. Hey, Dr. Kim, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for hosting me. This was a pleasure to talk about, and I know we could probably talk about this for hours, <laughs> but it's really been great to, to chat about this. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. It's going to be another special Protecting the Planet With Your Kids episode of the show, this time starring Rachel Sara, the author of Girl Warriors, a great juvenile nonfiction book that will inspire you and your kids. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, if you're the author of a fantastic children's book, please do visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click in the author's click here button at the top of the page. Find out how we can help you tell the world all about your great children's book. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our guest, Dr. Kim Dwyer. What a wonderful story. Be sure to check out Rocky's Christmas Journey. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Michael Murphy. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.